Our next, next speaker um, this afternoon uh, will be um, Dr. James L. Burnett, the Lewis and Ruth Frank Professor of Neuroscience at the Dartmouth Medical School. Um, Jim received his MD from Cornell University and then trained in internal medicine and in neurology at Dartmouth. Jim, did you tell me this is your 40th year at Dartmouth? 40th, yes. Um, uh, Dr. Burnett is the director of the program in clinical ethics at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Uh, he served for 28 years on the American Academy of Neurology's Ethics, Law, and Humanities Committee. Uh, 10 of those 28 years, uh, Jim was the chair of that committee. In 2011, he received the Presidential Award from the American Academy of Neurology for lifetime service to American neurology. Today, Jim will give a presentation on death determination in organ donors. Jim Burnett. Mark, thanks very much for the introduction and especially for inviting me here today. It's a great honor. Uh, I have some uh, few disclosures, which is now de rigueur in any kind of uh, meeting, but I don't think that any of these are going to influence uh, what I say, perhaps other than the last one serving on a national panel that's looking at the question of circulatory death. Uh, my learning objectives today are to look at the question of um, uh, death determination in critical care. Uh, because this is a, a seminar on ethical issues in organ donation, the original title was uh, Death Determination in Organ Donors, but what I have to say is going to pertain to non-donors as well and anybody uh, dying today in the critical care situation. I want to start by reviewing some points about the legal definition of death, uh, talk about death determination by brain tests, and highlight a few of the controversies, and determination of death by circulatory tests, and highlight a few of those controversies, and then talk a little bit about this panel that I've been working on and what we believe is appropriate for death determination and uh, circulation. First of all, the, a few comments about ICU uh, death determination. Uh, clearly, uh, the issues have been spurred by the availability of organ donation. Sociologists have studied the impact of uh, organ donation in the development of brain death in the 1960s and 70s, and it clearly spurred this. And uh, in the last 20 years, the uh, organ donation after the circulatory determination of death has spurred a similar attention to precision on identifying, if possible, what is the moment of death, and there's where a lot of the controversy occurs. Uh, so uh, we would look at the DBDD, or brain death determination, and DCDD, which used to be called non-heartbeating organ donation and donation after cardiac death. And, and ironically, perhaps, um, although the brain death controversies have not been resolved and have not disappeared, there's less uh, written and spoken about them now, and there's much more of an active controversy about some of the issues regarding death determination in the circulatory death donors. What we're going to do today is have a point-counterpoint where I'm going to present an approach, and then after I speak, Bob Trug from Boston Children's is going to present uh, his position. Those of you interested in seeing a, a similar point-counterpoint in print can look at uh, CHEST, uh, the journal CHEST in 2010, and I'll show the reference of this soon, um, in which we conducted a similar debate that uh, is in print. Let me start with the legal determination of death, or the legal definition of death, and there are lots of different ways to look at the question of the definition of death. There's a, a medical, there's a legal, there's what one might call an ontological or biophilosophical uh, there's religious uh, ways of looking at this. So the way the law looks, at, and I think everyone in this room knows, the Uniform Determination of Death Act, which uh, was proposed by the President's Commission in 1981, and to a greater or lesser extent has been incorporated into statutory uh, law in uh, the overwhelming majority of states. And it provides two uh, different criteria, a brain criterion and a circulatory criterion. And the words that I think one month pay attention to here are uh, irreversible and circulation. Uh, and I'll be coming back to those later. And finally, the last little comment of death, determination must be made in accordance with accepted medical standards. Now, these two criteria are not independent. 
And reading uh, carefully the uh, text of Defining Death, the President's Commission report, which was the fundamental document uh, defending the proposition of the UDDA, um, it's clear that the primary criterion is the brain criterion, and the circulatory respiratory criterion becomes valid only because when it exists, uh, it leads to the brain criterion, and only really in the presence, therefore, of supported respiration does the brain criterion need to be tested directly. Now, let me say a few words about um, brain death, the irreversible cessation of all of the brain's clinical functions uh, as human death. And of course, this is a misleading term, uh, but it has become standardized both in medical and in popular culture, uh, and uh, has been more or less accepted uh, throughout society and by medical practices, although a number of studies going back decades and still present show there's epidemic confusion about what this means. And uh, there are probably fewer active controversies about this now. Uh, looking worldwide, Ilko Vedics from the Mayo Clinic reported 10 years ago that at that time there were, uh, in addition to all of the states in the USA and all uh, Canadian provinces, that it was practiced in over 80 countries. And the critics, uh, some of whom are in our audience and, and our speakers uh, panel here today, um, irrespective of the merits of some of the arguments, which I believe have merits, uh, these have not created the traction necessary to change anything. And when this has been looked at carefully by high-level commissions, such as the Institute of Medicine review that was done in Cleveland at Case Western in 1995, culminating in that book published by uh, Stuart Youngner et al., uh, editing it in 1999, there was a belief that the way things are works well and should be left alone. The more recent uh, analysis by the Presidential Council, published in 2009, reached a similar conclusion that, yes, there were some defects in some of the conceptual parts of this, but as a public policy, it is working well and should be left alone. Now, the critiques, and um, I'll just summarize a few of them, and you'll hear more of them by the next speaker, are uh, first um, in a, if you will, onto an ontology issue that it's not really what we mean when we say that someone has died. Uh, Alan Schumann from UCLA clearly uh, made the point that the integration of subsystems rationale that I and my colleagues, for example, 30 years ago cited as one of the justifications, and I'll come back to that in a moment, uh, was inadequate, and the President's Council accepted that as true and came forward with an alternative justification or rationale, which uh, Alan also felt was inadequate. But in any event, um, that's, uh, that point has been made. Uh, Bob, uh, in his writings, eloquently has said that um, that it's, in a way, an unnecessary anachronism that the concept arose in an era when it needed to be um, respected in order to accomplish certain things that now could be accomplished through other ways, such as discontinuing life-sustaining therapy. That wasn't uh, possible to do in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and this was a solution to that problem. And similarly, um, organ donation, and again, Bob will uh, be talking about his um, uh, ideas about that, that, that it can be done by consent if the patient is beyond harm, dying and uh, beyond harm. Uh, religious opposition a little, although in most settings it's not a common uh, issue. Now what I'd like to do is just very briefly, and I apologize for uh, going through all this material so quickly, but I know we have a, a, an audience of uh, sophisticated people who are familiar with a lot of the work that has been done on this. I want to talk a little bit about the biophilosophical analysis that my colleagues at Dartmouth and I uh, proposed in 1981, and I've refined several times since then, um, that uh, provides an, a, an approach to this problem. And I think it's fair to say uh, uh, that even um, most of those who disagree with some of the substantive points that we made and some of the assertions that we have made agree that this type of analysis itself 
is fruitful and is a reasonable approach. And we came up with four sequential steps. The first was a, the paradigm stating the preconditions that frame the analysis, then the definition making explicit the ordinary meaning when we use the term death, the criterion of death, a general measurable standard that can be incorporated into a death statute, and the tests of death, which are uh, done by physicians to show that the criterion has been satisfied. So if uh, one looks at the paradigm conditions, these are the ones we came up with, and um, not everybody accepts these, but, but what they are is to clarify that um, uh, the meaning of the consensual usage of the non-technical word, it's not a technical word, and not to contrive a new definition the way some attempts uh, are to, if you will, redefine death, but rather the uh, ordinary meaning has been made ambiguous by life-sustaining technology, and we can't rely on it anymore, and we need to look a little more deeply. A second, that death fundamentally is a biological phenomenon. It's the cessation of life. Life is a biological phenomenon. It has social, anthropological, legal, religious, cultural, et cetera, uh, aspects, but it is fundamentally a biological phenomenon. We restrict the analysis to higher vertebrates. We're not talking about deaths of cells or tissues or organs or unicellular organisms. Those are valid, but not the task here. Uh, that the term applies only directly to organisms and other uses are metaphorical, like death of a culture, and specifically death of a person, and we'll come back to that a little bit. Uh, that the organism resides in one, only one of two states, alive or dead. There aren't in between states. You're either one or you're the other, and therefore death is an event, not a process. And in fact, it's the event separating a process of dying, which is a process, from the process of disintegration of the body, which is a process. And it's that event. And, and even though it's an event, it may not, we may not know exactly when it is. We may know it only in retrospect. But, but theoretically, it's an event. And of course, it's irreversible. Then um, the definition uh, that we uh, chose is the irreversible cessation of function of the organism as a whole. And I want to talk a little bit about that concept. The criterion is a brain, whole brain, criterion, irreversible cessation of function of critical number of neurons in the whole brain. And the tests have been put forward by the American Academy of Neurology, the Canadian Medical Association Journal, uh, last year by uh, the Children's Criteria by the Multi-Society Task Force. Um, so the organism as a whole is important to understand, to understand this. It's not the whole organism, but it's that functioning that is greater than the sum of the parts of the organism. And it, it looks at the question of the unity and wholeness and integrity of the organism. Uh, and this concept was first uh, discussed in the early part of the 20th century in a text by Jacques Loeb, the Rockefeller, now university um, biologist, uh, in a book entitled The Organism's Whole, published in 1916. Now, uh, biophilosophical analyses of this talk about emergent functions, these concepts that um, individual subunits, uh, when they're operating together, um, from those emerge functions that cannot be reduced to any single component of those, but rather emerge spontaneously in the presence of these. And this is the concept of wholeness and unity that uh, we're talking about. And, uh, and that there's a difference between the life of a component of an organism and of the organism itself. And that's really essential to grasp here. So that the definition is irreversible cessation of the critical functions of the organism as a whole, and the criterion is the whole brain criterion. And what is a brain dead patient, but uh, we say is dead, but subsystems of that patient clearly are alive. There's quite a bit of that patient who remains alive, but not their organism as a whole. Um, and the whole brain criterion, in addition to being coherent in that way, um, permit certain uh, other attractive features from a medical perspective in terms of determination that are attractive to neurologists, neurosurgeons, and intensivists who are those who are called to the bedside to do these determinations. And that is once intracranial pressure exceeds mean arterial blood pressure, there's no further intracranial forward blood flow. And then neurons that weren't killed by the original uh, injury, whether it was traumatic brain injury, meningitis, um, hypoxic ischemic neuronal injury following cardiac arrest, stroke, or whatever it was, 
um, are uh, killed secondarily, and it allows confirmatory tests showing absence of intracranial blood flow. So these tests um, uh, of death, the cardiopulmonary tests are sufficient when there's no uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation or mechanical uh, tracheal positive pressure ventilation, and the brain death tests are used when this is uh, used or planned, and the tests must have no false positives or negatives. The uh, society has been very concerned about false positive death determination. This is the a painting by the Belgian artist Antoine Wiertz hanging in the Wiertz Museum in Brussels, uh, occurring during a cholera epidemic when there was a false positive death determination, presumably someone who was hypovolemic uh, shock with no blood pressure and no palpable pulse, but was still alive. And this um, uh, type of painting, and of course the works of Edgar Allan Poe, uh, uh, similarly looking at premature burial, which is the English translation of the French title. And this type of device, many of you have seen this image before, uh, sold quite a few units in the 19th century, uh, where people would be buried in these special caskets in case the doctor had made an error on death determination. And there were elaborate treatises written about the signs of death to prevent uh, this sort of thing. And of course, the examination of the brain death uh, patient, which I'm not going to go through uh, here, but all of you are well aware, and this is from um, uh, Vedic's paper in neurology a couple of years ago, which is the um, brain death standards for adults from the American Academy of Neurology with the usual knowing a structural lesion, excluding reversible causes, unresponsiveness, cranial nerve reflexia, and proper apnea testing. So um, a quick review of some uh, both biophilosophical justification of the concept of brain death and some of the uh, testing and uh, so on uh, that we have. I'd like to uh, change gears now and to move to the second subject I wanted to cover today, which is the um, death determination in uh, after circulatory determination of death. And again, I'll use as the paradigm the patients who are in the, proto the DCDD protocols, uh, which I'm sure exist in the majority of medical centers of people here. But for those that don't have a lot of firsthand experience, let me just briefly summarize it, saying that the usual situation is of a dying ICU patient who is ventilator dependent, uh, usually with severe brain damage, although they're not categorically limited to that group, but they're not brain dead. If they were brain dead, one wouldn't need to go through this exercise. They would simply be declared. But these people are not. Yet, because of the magnitude of the damage and the uh, poor prognosis neurologically, families make a decision to withdraw life sustaining treatment, which, as you all know, is exceedingly common and is a very common modus of death in ICUs throughout the country. However, in addition to that, they would like the patient to serve as an organ donor, so the protocols essentially um, link in time the uh, um, readiness of the surgical team to do the um, donation with the um, stopping life-sustaining therapy and death determination. And uh, uh, this has been well described in a number of papers. But the controversy of this has been present since the beginning if you look back at the original work from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where many, where this protocol, really, it wasn't the only one, but it was the most well-reported and pu highly publicized one uh, of this uh, uh, type, uh, there was significant question raised then and now on the same question, which is, is the donor really dead at the moment that they're declared dead and taken to the OR for or organ? Procurement and the, um, basically the argument went that um, uh, I mean the way it's done, of course, is that uh, in Pittsburgh they would, uh, after dialing down the ventilator or extubating the patient, or however it was done, uh, the heart would stop beating and they would wait two minutes by the clock, and after two minutes of asystole they would declare the patient dead, whisk them to the OR. And the question was, at two minutes after a Sicily, are they really dead, given the fact that we know that some of some patients could have their heart restarted and circulation regenerated, therefore, um, uh, by cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Now, we know that these people have DNR orders, and you're not going to do that. But that 
it doesn't matter because what if you were going to do that? Um, one, uh, this would be uh, possible, and if death is uh, by definition irreversible, then something's wrong here uh, because you've just uh, reversed something. And does it violate the death statute, which says irreversible in the UDDA? And, uh, and the question that we'll be discussing later has to do with the dead donor rule. Should that be suspended or abrogated, or is that necessary anyway? Now, each institution who have DCD protocols have their own standards for uh, death determination. Uh, and most, I, I can't, I haven't surveyed them all, but there is a report that's looked at uh, all of the protocols uh, as of last year in the United States and Canada. The majority um, follow the IOM recommendation of five minutes, um, but some still do what Pittsburgh does at two minutes. And I'm sure all of you read the paper in the New England Journal in the fall of 2008 from Denver Children's Hospital where they did three successful neonatal heart transplants from DCDD uh, neonatal donors. Uh, and in those, in the second two, they started out with two minutes, but then they asked their ethics committee if it would be okay if they reduce the uh, required interval of asystole from 120 to 75 seconds, which they approved, and that was done in the following two. So there's this odd hoax uh, uh, part of, of this whole thing that's not very satisfying. And we're going to be talking, and this was the paper, that I'm, the Buczek paper, but there was in the New England Journal, and uh, all of the protocols, uh, except for experimental ones being done in this country now, are the so-called control, like the paradigm I gave where they're in the unit, the decision's made to stop, their life-sustaining treatment has stopped, they're watched, everything is under control. The un so-called uncontrolled ones, of course, would be the people in or more likely out of hospital who just dropped dead of primary cardiac arrest, usually a primary V-fib or a systolic arrest, and then um, if they can't be resuscitated, then they would be an organ donor. That's the so-called uncontrolled. I'm not going to be talking too much about that, but I'll mention. Well, what happened was I had, when they did this, they asked several of us to write little papers, and Bob wrote one, and I wrote one, and Bob Veach wrote one also that was these little perspective articles in the New England Journal that accompany a paper that they anticipate is going to have a controversy, and, and it did. Um, and there was quite a bit of controversy about this, and uh, some of the controversy focused on whether, the pers whether these babies were in fact dead at the moment that th their hearts were taken out. Uh, part of it was about the shortening of the interval and, and all that sort of thing. And um, part of my uh, commentary had to do with, gee, you know, it's not right that, there, that every protocol would have a different depth determination. There needs to be some uniformity, and the uniformity should be based on a reasoned data driven and to some extent consensus driven uh, approach to this that uh, uh, has some kind of uniformity. So the uh, HRSA that had funded, that funds these experimental organ donation protocols did put a panel together uh, and we worked on this uh, in the control setting uh, right from right after that until uh, 2010 and um, published this paper and I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the uh, findings in this paper. So some of the issues regarding the legal definition of death that our group um, tackled uh, had to do with um, the fact that the UDDA and the President's Commission chose the term irreversible but didn't define what they meant by irreversible. And in fact, when you read through the, the document defining death, they use the term permanent and irreversible interchangeably. But there's an important distinction between those that I think and our group thinks is important to understand. And uh, these, despite the fact that they've been used synonymously, there's an important distinction there. Uh, by the Oxford English Dictionary, irreversible means cannot be undone, irrevocable. And it's an absolute and univocal uh, thing. It's essentially impossible, uh, at least with current technology. Whereas permanent means continuing without change or enduring. And it's an equivocal and a contingent um, condition, that it's contingent on certain conditions. Uh, without those, without which they, uh, it doesn't exist. So uh, those are some uh, points. And uh, so irreversible means cannot reverse using current technology. Permanent means will not be restored spontaneously or through intervention. And if you look at the set of permanently lost functions, they encompass those that are lost irreversibly. And those that are lost permanently rapidly progress to those that are lost irreversibly. And the question is, which of these do we mean when we're saying uh, for the determination of death. 
Um, and we made the claim, and um, not everybody goes along with this, you'll hear uh, exceptions, that, that the permanence was the accepted medical standard of the application of the circulatory criterion of death in the non-donation circumstance. Terminally ill patient in a hospital, expected to die, getting palliative care, has a DNR order, they stop breathing, their heart stops beating, they're immediately declared dead. One doesn't require the doctor to prove that it's irreversible by either observing them for 30 or 40 minutes or however long it would take to uh, make it transparent that it was irreversible or to try to resuscitate them and show that that's unsuccessful uh, and thereby prove it's irreversible. That is not necessary. As long as it's permanent, that's sufficient. So one of the uh, points about this uh, was that it's already the standard in non-donation circumstance. One could say, yeah, but this is different. Here it's consequential, and I agree. It is very consequential in this situation, uh, and it was perhaps inconsequential in the previous one, the non-donation circumstance. But um, let's move on to some of the other points about this. Um, in a conference in uh, Philadelphia in 2005 of a group of people involved in this from a variety of areas uh, that included uh, ICU people who were involved in death determination as well as transplant surgeons, there was a consensus that when we talk about asystole, we're not talking about electrical asystole. We're talking about mechanically asystole or so-called pulseless electrical activity because the issue in death is circulation, not cardiac function. Um, and uh, part of the uh, confusion was that a former term of this was donation after cardiac death, and I used it myself. All of us did. But that isn't really the issue. When you look at the UDDA or any death statute or the meaning of death, it all talks about circulation. It doesn't talk about cardiac function. Now, admittedly, the, cardi the heart is responsible for the circulation in the majority of the time, except in special technical circumstances. Nevertheless, uh, it, the distinction between those two becomes relevant uh, here because what we need to show is the permanent cessation of circulation. So pulseless electrical activity that does not lead to circulation counts as a systole commonly seen in cardiac arrest. Our group said that pulse palpation as a means to determine cessation of circulation was not sensitive enough. You really needed to have either an indwelling arterial line or echocardiography looking for open and closing of the aortic valve, or a Doppler looking, or something in the organ donation to be sure that you didn't end up with the patient like the Veerts patient, not that we would do that in our units, but uh, it's pretty important to be sure. And that the question of asystole was empirical. Um, I said that the permanent, you can say that it's permanent when you can show that there w it will not spontaneously reverse and we will not reverse it. So what about spontaneous reversing? This is so-called auto-resuscitation, and some of the early work in this by Mike DeVita from Pittsburgh and other people um, showed that there were these cases of so-called auto-resuscitation where the heart would start again after 65 seconds. What Mike didn't do and the early work didn't do was distinguish those who restored to PEA from those that restored to circulation, and that was done later. And this just lists the different uh, lengths uh, that were required for um, the different protocols to try to eliminate autoresuscitation. Well, the Hornby Group at Montreal did a very important study published in Critical Care Medicine in 2010 where they comprehensively reviewed all published cases of autoresuscitation. And they showed an important distinction. And that is, in plan withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy, such as that occurs in controlled DCDD. There wasn't a single reported case of autoresuscitation to restored circulation. Yes, there were cases to restored PEA, but not circulation. However, in um, failed CPR, where somebody had a primary cardiac arrest, dropped dead, resuscitated, after 25 minutes, the team says, this is hopeless, we're stopping. They stop. There have been innumerable cases reported of re-starting uh, 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 of the heart to the point of circulation. Some of it is from the auto-peep phenomenon, some from other causes. But that is a well-recognized thing, including uh, one case of uh, well-documented 
up to seven minutes after failed CPR. Um, so what you can say in the uh, controlled circumstances that after five minutes or some brief time, even less than that, of, of asystole, that respiratory and circulatory functions are lost permanently. We know that there will be no CPR and auto resuscitation will not occur. And therefore, it satisfies the criteria for permanent cessation of circulation. In order to prove that, we want to do some technique that sensitively measures the presence or absence of blood flow and uh, wait at least two minutes, probably, even though argue, arguably that's a long time, because the database on which these data are um, generated is very small, and therefore the confidence limits aren't too high. Um, uh, some comments about the dead donor rule, and, and I don't want to take uh, much more time, but I think I have about two more minutes, that, um, uh, of course, it says the multi-organ donor uh, first must be dead, and the corollary of that is you cannot kill the donor to procure organs. And some uh, scholars, and, and uh, Bob and some of his colleagues, have written very uh, uh, convincingly about that, that if the patient uh, consents for donation and the dying patient is beyond harm, my position, and maybe we can debate this a little bit in the um, Q&A period, is that, that it, um, I worry about it as public policy because even though in highly motivated and intelligent donors, I think it would work well uh, for a general public policy, I'm concerned about public confidence in the system. So our panel um, recommended that the C in DCDD be circulatory and not cardiac. It's always hard to retroactively change an accepted uh, thing, but we, I think, uh, defended why this should be the issue of circulation and not cardiac function. That we can continue to rely on permanence in the organ donation as we do in non-donation circumstances. That if we do that, that correctly uh, applied, it respects the dead donor rule. We need to use these blood flow measurements. We should choose a conservative interval, as in systole, uh, until such time that our database of cases ex extends to such a point that the confidence intervals get sharp enough that we can reduce that. It's just a matter of prudence to do that. That uh, we had talked about it, and we didn't have time to get into that. Uh, so I don't want to get into some of these other points. Um, I don't want to overstay my time here, but what I tried to do was to first uh, talk a little bit about the legal definition of death and parse some of the words of the UDDA, particularly their term irreversible and make the point that the physicians involved uh, meant permanent. And if you look at the Appendix F of uh, defining death, it's clear that they were talking about permanent, which I think is the medical standard. And that it's worth uh, noting that the medical standard may not always be completely congruent with what you might call the ontological approach uh, uh, to this. Uh, but it's consistent with the uh, medical standard to use permanence that um, uh, most of the brain death controversies have been mitigated to the point that groups that have studied this, including recently, feel that it continues to represent a coherent and uh, uh, framework with good public policy, that now more of the controversies are in circulation, um, and that um, uh, these uh, HRSA panel uh, in our paper in Critical Care Medicine a couple of years ago talked about the controlled situation. We're, our group is now meeting and talking about the uncontrolled, de determining death of the uncontrolled donor, which is frankly a much more challenging question. Thank you very much.